Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mass Literacy, Equitable Literacy Instruction with Emily Hansford. I want to let you know that there is a closed captioning option at the bottom of the screen. If you scroll down, you can find that. Also, we will be using the Q&A function today. So please, if you have any questions, if you would put those into the, the Q&A. We will have time to address questions at the end of the webinar, and there also will be a brief survey at the end because we know we'll not be able to get to each and every person's questions. And so you will have an opportunity to ask any follow up questions there. So let's get started. We're thrilled to be hosting a series of webinars that feature prominent researchers in the field and a journalist who's bringing the science of teaching reading to the forefront across the nation who you're going to get to hear from today. Our next two webinar series are January 27th and February 3rd. These webinar series are being recorded and will be posted on our Mass Literacy website and we will let you know when they are. My name is Susan Kazarite. In case you don't know who I am, I am one of the literacy content leads at the department. I will be playing the part of MC today. Shortly, I will be turning it over to our featured presenter, Emily Hanford, and then turning it over to Donna Goldstein, who's another literacy content lead, who will be making connections to the Mass Literacy Guide website. And then we will finish our afternoon with the Director of Literacy and Humanities, Catherine Tarka, who will be doing a Q&A with Emily. Mass Literacy is a statewide effort to empower educators with the evidence-based practices for literacy that all students need. Evidence-based instruction provided within schools and classrooms that are culturally responsive and sustaining will put our youngest students on a path toward literacy for life. As part of Mass Literacy, over the next several years, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will offer early literacy programming paired with implementation supports, including resources, professional development, and grants. This is a screenshot of the Mass Literacy landing page. Here you can see a video featuring classroom teachers, specialists, and a couple of the researchers who advised us on the guide. Many voices, perspectives, and areas of expertise contributed to this work. The featured speakers in this video were among the 100 plus stakeholders who advised us on this work. We engaged with research advisors from across the country and even internationally. Massachusetts preschool and elementary teachers, administrators, and ed prep faculty also advised us. We also partnered with the Massachusetts Reading Association and collaborated with the Mass Association of School Administrators, working with a group of assistant superintendents. And now, whom you've all been waiting to hear from, I'm so excited. Emily Hanford is a senior educational correspondent at APM Report. APM Reports, the documentary and public reporting part of American public media. She has been working in public media for more than two decades as a reporter, a producer, an editor, news director, and program host. Emily has been at American public media since 2008, where she produces education documentaries that air on public radio stations nationwide and can also be heard on the Educate podcast. She has written and produced content for many news outlets, including NPR, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, Washington Monthly, and PBS NewsHour. Her work has won numerous honors, including a DuPont Columbia Award, a Casey Medal, and awards from EWA and the Associated Press. In 2017, Emily won the Excellence in Media Reporting on Education Research Award from the American Educational Research Association. She is a frequent speaker and moderator and is the host of the Ways and Means podcast. 
And for those of you who are hailing from Western Mass like me, one of the most exciting things is she graduated from Amherst College. So without any further ado, I would like to turn my screen over and welcome Emily Hanford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was so nice looking at that picture of me when I actually had a haircut. It's been so many months. It's terrible to look at uh, this long hair. Anyway, I'm going to share my screen with you here. Uh, be, bear with me here for a second. Whoops, sorry. Um, okay, I'm sharing my screen. You should be able to see that now. Let me play. Um, here we go. Okay. Well, thank you um, for having me today. And not only did I go to school in Western Massachusetts, but I grew up in Massachusetts. So I am um, especially honored to be part of the conversation that you're having in this state about literacy. So I am here today to tell you what I have learned just over the past few years about the science of reading. I'm, I'm not a reading teacher. I'm not a reading researcher. As you heard, I'm a journalist. And because I'm a journalist, I have had the opportunity over the past four years or so to read thousands of pages of books, reports, and articles about how skilled reading works, what kids need to learn to become skilled readers, and what's going on when children struggle to learn how to read. I've talked with hundreds of people. I've visited nine, 10 states to try to understand how reading is being taught in schools today. And what I've learned has shocked me, frankly. And it's basically this, over the past 50 years or so, Cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists and linguists and other researchers all over the world have conducted thousands of studies in classrooms and in labs to try to understand how we learn to read. But this mountain of scientific evidence about reading is not making its way into many schools. Teachers and other educators are not, for the most part, being taught this science in their educator preparation programs. They're not taught this science in professional development that they get on the job. And in fact, some of what they learn about reading and how to teach it is actually at odds with what the scientific evidence says. I took a class on the science of reading and most of my classmates were teachers. And here's what they said about their preparation to teach reading. I didn't feel adequately prepared to teach reading. This is hard for me to admit because I have several degrees and I felt like I should know what I was doing. Another teacher. I kept falsely reassuring myself my students weren't making much growth because of this reason or that reason, although deep down I feared it was me and my instruction. I wasn't adequately prepared. It's not that I didn't care, it's that I didn't know any better. And this teacher, I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? So what is reading science or the science of reading? It's a term that's being thrown around a lot these days. So here's a definition. This is from Mark Seidenberg. He's a cognitive scientist and he's been studying reading for a long time, since the 1970s. So here's his definition. The science of reading is a body of basic research in developmental psychology, educational psychology, cognitive science, and cognitive neuroscience on reading, one of the most complex human behaviors, and its biological bases. This research has con been conducted for decades in the US and around the world. The research has important implications for helping children to succeed, but it has not been incorporated in how teachers are trained for the job or how children are taught. So what does this science say? I mean, what are the basics of this? And I think a really good place to begin is with something called the simple view of reading. Now, it's really important to understand that the simple view of reading does not say that reading is simple. As Mark Seidenberg said, it is one of the most complex human behaviors. The simple view of reading says that reading comprehension, which is what everyone cares about, can be divided into two different parts. So the simple view was first proposed when I was in high school, at Brookline High School, by researchers Philip Goff and William Tunmer in 1986. They proposed this model because they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension. Everyone agrees that the goal of reading is to comprehend text. The question is, how does a little kid get there? The simple view says that reading comprehension is the product of two things. One is your ability to decode words. So you see the letter string R-E-A-D-I-N-G, and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. The other part of the equation is your language comprehension. 
So that's your ability to understand spoken language. So we're not talking about your ability to read text. Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you, she's reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence, you know what she's doing. So the simple view says that if you have really good language comprehension skills, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero because zero times anything is zero. The simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension skills, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not going to be very good either. Now let's look at how this applies to learning how to read. Most kids, when they enter school, have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. They have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading equation. But they do have something when it comes to the language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. This is why people familiar with the science of reading call for an emphasis on phonics instruction in the early grades. Because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension, and you have a bunch of five and six year olds in front of you with language comprehension skills, but virtually no decoding skills, what do you need to do to help those children get to reading comprehension? You need to help those children develop decoding skills. So what you wanna focus on with little kids is getting their decoding skills up to their level of language comprehension. Now, the simple view clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a very big mistake because it's only half the equation. And as everyone knows, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots and lots of words, and some kids have far smaller vocabularies. So reading instruction that aligns with the simple view has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So that means lessons and activities that expand children's oral vocabularies. I was in a first grade classroom in Oakland, California, where reading instruction was deliberately aligned with the simple view. And what I saw was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction. And the kids were broken into small groups depending on the level of their decoding skills because kids can be at very different places. And another part of the reading instruction was explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading out loud by the teacher. Now the words that the kids had learned were posted on cards all over the classroom. And they included words like gigantic, extraordinary, neighborly, and ridiculous. Now those are not words that the vast majority of first graders are gonna be able to decode and they shouldn't be expected to. But the first graders in this class were learning the pronunciation and meaning of those words so that when they're able to decode them, they'll know what the words mean. By the way, every child in this class, every single one spoke a language other than English at home. The simple view was proposed as a theoretical model back in 1986, and the basics of this model have been confirmed over and over and over again since. I cannot stress how much research there is that backs this up. The simple view is helpful because it disentangles some of the stuff that is most contentious in the debates about reading. In what's known as the whole language view and in the balanced literacy view more recently, the focus right from the start of reading instruction should be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading. Whole language and balanced literacy are meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction, as opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach, which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. Early reading instruction that aligns with the science is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. Everyone agrees that meaning is the goal. The question is, how does a little kid get there? Now, some of you have probably seen this. This is another model for understanding how skilled reading works. It's known as Scarborough's Rope. Hollis Scarborough is a psychologist at Haskins Labs at Yale. She's been studying reading development since the 1980s. Now Scarborough's rope helps unpack what goes into each side of the equation that was put forth in the simple view. The upper strand is language comprehension. You can see that that's a little bit more complex. There's more to it. It's more than half the equation. This model shows that language comprehension is really complex. It's not just all the words you know the meaning of in oral language. It's also your level of knowledge. It's the stuff you know. It's your understanding of how language works, language structure, grammar, your ability to make inferences, understand things like metaphors. This is a more nuanced explanation of what goes into the language comprehension part of the simple view equation. And it can help teachers and parents understand what might be going on when kids are decoding well, but they're struggling with reading comprehension. Very often they have a language comprehension issue. Now the lower strand of Scarborough's rope is the word recognition strand. 
Like the simple view of reading, Scarborough's Robe shows that without good word recognition skills, you're not going to become a skilled reader. And the rope unpacks the various skills and abilities that go into word recognition. And you can see that one element, just one element, is decoding. That's basically your phonics knowledge. Do you have a good understanding of how letters and combinations of letters represent the sounds in words? Teaching students the basic letter sound combinations in the English language gives them access to successfully sounding out more than 80% of the words in English print. But children need more than just phonics knowledge to be successful with written English. I think it's more useful to think about teaching children how their written language works. English spelling is not just based on the sounds and words. English is what's known as a morphophonemic language, meaning our spelling patterns are based on both sounds and meaning. So to understand English spelling, kids should be taught some morphology. In other words, they need to understand the meaningful parts of words and how English words are put together. Root words, prefixes, suffixes. And children can use some etymology too. That is to understand English spelling, it helps to know something about the history of our language. English has a reputation for being a wacky language that's full, ex full of exceptions, but it's not. It's actually this really cool melting pot language that has complex spelling patterns because English has roots in Greek and Latin and French and Anglo-Saxon and other languages. Now, written English is perhaps the most difficult alphabetic language to learn. It takes two to three years for a typically developing reader to master the basics of written English. Now, in contrast, it takes only a few months for most kids in Italy to learn how to decode Italian because Italian spelling is almost perfectly regular. Italian is spelled the way it sounds. Now, one of the reasons that we fought so much about reading instruction in the English speaking world is that there's a lot to, lot to teaching children written English. So there's a lot to argue about in terms of how to teach it. So back to Scarborough's rope and the elements of the word recognition strand. So there's phonological awareness. So that's understanding the sounds and words. There's decoding, which is understanding how letters represent those sounds. And then there's something called sight recognition of familiar words. And this, in my opinion, is where things get really, really interesting. When you are a skilled reader, you do not actually have to decode most of the words you encounter. When you see a word that's familiar to you, you know the word immediately on sight. You don't have to sound it out. Now, scientists refer to the words that are instantly recognizable to you as sight words. That term, sight words, can be really confusing because teachers and reading scientists usually mean different things when they use that term. In schools, sight words are typically words that kids are supposed to memorize. So they may be words with unusual spellings that are going to be difficult for kids to decode, or they may be words that kids are going to come across a lot in their reading. In other words, high frequency words. Children often come home with these words on flashcards and they're supposed to memorize them. But what the science shows is that having kids memorize lots of words is not the best path to good word recognition skills. And it turns out that weak word recognition skills are the most common and the most debilitating source of reading problems. Struggling readers may also have language comprehension issues, but when children do not get off to a good start with decoding, it has an impact on the continued development of their language comprehension. And eventually kids may be weak on the language comprehension side because they are weak on the word recognition side. This problem has been described as the Matthew effect, which is a biblical reference. Basically, when it comes to reading, the rich get richer and it happens fast. Here's how it works. If you come into school with lots of language comprehension, but you struggle with learning how to decode words, your ability to continue to develop language comprehension may be impeded because one of the best ways to increase your knowledge and your vocabulary and your reasoning and your understanding of the structure of language is through reading. In contrast, if you come into school weak on the language comprehension side, but you are taught how to decode, you have just been given the gift that is your best bet for gaining knowledge and vocabulary because you can read the words. This is why equity in education begins with good phonics instruction in the early grades. It's one of the most important things that teachers can do to try to even the playing field between kids who come from homes that give them an edge on the language comprehension side 
and kids who come from homes that may not be as rich and resourced when it comes to vocabulary development and access to knowledge. Good phonics instruction is where educational equity begins. It doesn't end there, but it's a foundation. Now, the good news is that most schools seem to be doing some kind of phonics instruction. Publishers and authors of curriculum materials know that if their stuff is going to have a chance of being considered research-based, evidence-based, there has to be some phonics. And if they didn't know that or believe it until recently, they're quickly adding a phonics component now. So that means we must be on the right path. The reading instruction is finally starting to line up with the science. Unfortunately, I don't think this is the case. Because while more and more schools are adding a 20 or 30 minute phonics block, what I also see in schools are things like this. So these are word reading strategies and you will find them in classrooms all over the country. I have seen them everywhere on posters, on the walls, on bookmarks that are sent home with kids. They're on Pinterest, teachers pay teachers. You can find all kinds of these little animals all over Google. I've also seen things like this. These are strategies for kids to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. And these strategies seem sensible enough. You get to a word you don't know, what can you do? You can look at the picture to try to figure out what the word might be. You don't wanna completely guess. So you can look at the first letter, look at how the word begins. That'll narrow your choices. You can then check to see if you're right. You can reread the sentence using the word and see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, you can just skip the word and move on. And hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. So what's the theory of how reading works that these strategies are based on? What's the idea about how kids learn to read words? So these strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that came to be known as three cueing. The idea is that readers use three different kinds of information or cues to identify words as they're reading. The idea was originally proposed by an education professor named Ken Goodman back in 1967 at the American Educational Research Association Conference in New York City. He laid out the original theory in a paper that he called reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. Now in this paper, Goodman rejected the idea that reading is a precise process that involves exact or detailed perception of words or letters. Instead, he argued that as people read, they make predictions about what the words on the page are using these three cues. Graphic cues, what do the letters tell you about what the word might be? Syntactic cues, what kind of a word could it be? And semantic word uh, cues, what word would make sense here based on the context. In his paper, Goodman concluded this. He wrote, skill in reading involves not greater precision, but more accurate first guesses based on better sampling techniques, greater control over language structure, broadened experiences, and increased conceptual development. As the child develops reading skill and speed, he uses increasingly fewer graphic cues. So this was kind of a new twist on prevailing ideas about how reading works. And it went on to become the theoretical basis of the whole language approach to teaching reading. So for the, for the couple centuries previous to the introduction of whole language, the debate about how reading works and how to teach it had focused on one of two big ideas. So one idea is that reading is a visual memory process. And the teaching method associated with this idea is the whole word method, which is a little bit different than whole language. The basic idea with whole word is that if you see words enough and you associate those words with their meaning, you eventually store the words in your memory as visual images, like little pictures. So this is basically the idea behind long lists of sight words that kids are supposed to memorize. The other idea is that reading requires knowledge of the relationships between sounds and letters and that the way to identify a word is to sound it out. That's the phonics approach. So reading instruction was basically a series of pendulum swings between whole word and phonics until this new idea came along that said people don't read by sounding out words and they don't read by memorizing words as wholes either. Instead, they use this cueing system. That is, they use context to predict what the words will be and they use letters to check their predictions. Now, many teachers know this cueing theory of word reading as MSV. So M is for using meaning to figure out what a word is, S is for using sentence structure or syntax, and V is for using visual information, the letters in the word. You will find this MSV idea in lots of curriculum materials that define themselves as balanced literacy. Now you can trace the roots of this MSV idea back to the work of a woman named Mari Clay. Mari Clay was a developmental psychologist in New Zealand who came up with ideas about reading that were similar to Ken Goodman's at about the same time. They didn't develop these ideas together, but they did meet and travel in similar literacy circles back in the 80s and 90s. 
Clay built her ideas into a reading intervention program for struggling first graders called Reading Recovery. Reading Recovery was implemented across New Zealand in the 1980s, and it went on to become one of the most widely used reading intervention programs in the world. Clay's theories were popularized as part of core reading instruction here in the United States by Irene Fountas and Gaysu Pinnell, their education professors who learned from Clay back in the 1980s. Fountas and Pinnell are well known for an approach to reading uh, known as guided reading and for a widely used reading assessment system that uses what are known as leveled books. And Fountas and Pinnell also sell a reading intervention program that's very popular called Leveled Literacy Intervention or LLI. You will also find this cueing theory of reading in the units of study materials written by Lucy Calkins at Teachers College Columbia. Now, you will find some phonics in the Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell approaches. In fact, Lucy Calkins recently created a units of study for teaching phonics program, and Fountas and Pinnell have books and materials to teach phonics too. They have for a long time. But phonics is presented as one way to know what a word is. It's one strategy, that third cue in the three cueing system. So what schools need to know is that when they buy materials from Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell, they are buying an approach to teaching reading that's rooted in a particular theory about how reading works. And it's this idea that skilled readers use meaning and context to identify words as they read. So what you're likely to find in a lot of American classrooms today is 20 to 30 minutes of a phonics program, and then readers workshop and guided reading where kids are taught that when they come to a word they don't know, they can sound it out and use what they've learned in their phonics lessons, but they can also use the cueing strategies. They can think about a word that makes sense, they can look at the first letter of the word, or they can take a page from Skippy the Frog and they can skip the word altogether. Now the question is, what's wrong with this? I mean, why not teach kids lots of strategies to help them when they come to a word they don't know? Why not teach cueing? Well, it comes back to what scientists have learned about reading. What is going on in these little boys' brains as they're learning to read? And for a long time, no one knew. And that is one of the reasons we fought so much about how to teach reading. But as I've said, over the past half century or so, scientists have figured out a whole lot. And here's a key thing that they figured out. Skilled readers do not use cues and context to read words. In fact, what scientists have discovered is that this is how poor readers read. Poor readers often have a hard time with word identification. Too many of the words they come across are little mysteries, series of letters they don't know and can't quite figure out. So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to understand what the words say. They memorize as many words as they can. When they come across a word they don't know, they look at the first few letters and try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to try to come up with a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. Often, they can get the gist of what they're reading this way. But using context, guessing and skipping words, this is not what reading is like when you're a skilled reader. What cognitive scientists have figured out is that a key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or predict or use context. Skilled readers know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight. In fact, if you're a skilled reader, your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. So how did your brain get so good at that? It happens through this process called orthographic mapping. I think educators have to understand the basics of orthographic mapping to understand why phonics is so important and to understand why cueing is not a good idea. So here's a quick and simplified explanation of what orthographic mapping is. Orthographic mapping is the process we use to store printed words in our long-term memory. The way you do that is by attending closely to how a written word is spelled and then linking that sequence of letters to the word's pronunciation and its meaning. For a really simple example, a child knows the meaning and pronunciation of the word cat. The word gets orthographically mapped to her memory when she links the sounds cat to the written word C-A-T. So this requires an awareness of the speech sounds and words, that's phonemic awareness. It also requires an understanding of how those sounds are represented by letters, that's phonics. So you need phonemic awareness and phonics to orthographically map words into your long-term memory. And once a word has been orthographically mapped to your memory, you know it instantly on sight. In fact, you cannot suppress your ability to read that word. You don't have to sound out the word when you see it. You know it instantly though, because at some point you successfully sounded it out and you linked the spelling of the word in your mind with the meaning and the pronunciation of that word. By about second grade, 
typically developing reader who has acquired good phonics skills needs just a few exposures to a word through its pronunciation, its spelling, and its meaning, and bam, the word is mapped to her memory. The more words a reader maps to her memory this way, the more she can focus on the meaning of what she's reading. She's not using her brain power to identify words. She's using her brain power to understand what she's reading. And this is the goal for readers to comprehend what they're reading. But when teachers use the cueing system I told you about, when they teach all those word reading strategies, they're actually impeding the orthographic mapping process. So I'm going to explain this with a story really quickly. These are first graders in California, in Oakland, and a literacy coach who worked with these girls came to see that teaching the cueing system, or MSV, that meaning structure visual idea, it was actually making it harder for her students to learn how to read. Margaret was hired by the Oakland Unified School District in 2015 to teach leveled literacy intervention. LLI is the reading intervention program I mentioned uh, that was developed by Irene Fountas and Gacy Pinnell. LLI does include some phonics instruction, but it also teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they have lots of strategies for figuring out the word. They can sound it out, but they can also use pictures and context and other cues to try to come up with a good guess. So this literacy coach, Margaret Goldberg, started teaching LLI. And around the same time, she found a bunch of unopened materials sitting on a shelf in her school collecting dust. And it was a systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program that teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they sound it out and it doesn't teach any cueing. And in this phonics and phonemic awareness program, beginning readers practice reading in decodable books that contain words with spelling patterns they've been taught so they don't have to guess at words. They don't have to use the context. Margaret started teaching some of her groups LLI with cueing and some of her groups she taught systematic phonics and phonemic awareness with no cueing. And she started to notice differences between the two groups of kids, not just in how well they were reading, but in the way they approached their reading. She and a colleague recorded first graders talking about what makes them good readers. So this is a video that I'm gonna play for you. Mia is in the white shirt. She was learning phonics and no cueing and Jabri is in the pink jacket. She was taught the cueing system. Yes, what makes you good readers? I learn a lot. Because I look at the pictures and I read it. Ooh. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't know how to read? Yes. Like when you started kind kindergarten? Of. Yeah. What helped you learn how to read? How did you learn? By looking, looking at, at the, the pictures. Anything else? Looking at the words and sounding them out. So Margaret Goldberg was seeing this over and over again in her two groups of students. One group of kids was taking away from their reading instruction that reading is about looking closely at words and sounding them out. And another group of children was learning that when you come to a word you don't know, you don't have to look at it carefully and try to connect the spelling with the pronunciation and the meaning. Instead, you can look away from the word. You can look at the pictures. You can look at the other words in the sentence. Basically, you search around for clues to help you identify the word. Now remember, orthographic mapping requires you to look carefully at words so your brain links the spelling with the sounds and the meaning. But cueing teaches kids to look away from words. Here's what Margaret Goldberg said to me about the kids in her LLI groups. She said, I did lasting damage to these kids. It was so hard to ever get them to stop looking at a picture to guess what a word would be. It was so hard to ever get them to slow down and sound a word out because they had had this experience of knowing that you predict what you read before you read it. As Margaret was noticing the differences between her two groups of students, she was discovering the scientific research on reading. It was not stuff she knew or had been taught. She was shocked by what she was learning and how different it was from what the curriculum materials were telling her about how reading works. But what Margaret was learning from the curriculum materials about how reading works is what lots of teachers are learning. This, I think, is a big elephant in the room when it comes to reading instruction in the United States right now. Schools and publishers are adding what I've come to think of as a phonics patch. They're checking the phonics box, but they're still teaching cueing. Why is that? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think a big one is that schools are better at adding things than they are at taking things away. And many educators believe in cueing because if they were taught anything about how reading works, they were likely taught this idea that readers use meaning, structure, and visual cues to identify words as they're reading. And cueing seems to work for some kids because some kids, maybe even most kids in some schools, are actually going to learn to read no matter how they're taught. They will learn to read in spite of the instruction, but many kids won't. 
So I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, I've produced a series of podcast episodes and articles over the past few years where I've reported on what I've been talking to you about today, what I've been learning about this. And the most recent podcast episode and article is called What the Words Say. And this is where I try to explain the consequences of all this. And the story starts with a visit to a juvenile detention center where you will find an awful lot of struggling readers. One study showed that a quarter of young offenders had reading skills below that of an average seven-year-old. Other studies show half or more of adults in prison struggle with basic reading tasks. A big problem we're facing in this country is that reading instruction right now is based on an assumption about reading that turns out not to be true. The assumption that is, is as long as kids are in an environment that supports and encourages lots of reading, they will eventually become good readers. When kids struggle to learn how to read under those conditions, there are typically two responses. One response is there must be a problem in the home. The child wasn't read to enough. The other response is there must be a problem in the child. He or she has a disability. But usually it's neither of those things. Most of the time when kids can't read well, it's because they were not taught how to do it. So I will leave you with my contact information and a website where we've collected all of these podcast episodes and articles about reading so you can read them or listen to them. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking a little too much time and I will stop sharing my screen and we can go to questions. Thank you, Emily. Before we go to questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Donna Goldstein to just make some quick connections to the math literacy guide. Thank you so much, Emily. Sure. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, that, that was absolutely amazing. Okay, I'm going to share my screen right now. Let me pull up the guide. Okay, um, when Susan opens today, she gave you some background on the guide and Emily shared a lot with you around how reading skills developed and evidence-based approaches to support that. I want to bring you to one particular place within the guide. It's skills for early reading. And skills for really re early reading, excuse me, really echo and seek to amplify a lot of what Emily shared. We have information around the simple view of reading right up in the top corner at skills for early reading, explaining the simple view again with some useful resources. And also then within that, we have broken out each of the skills below either fluent word reading and language comprehension, where you can go to learn more about. For example, if you wanted to know more about the role that phonics and decoding play into the development of fluent word reading, you can go there and learn what they are, how they contribute to reading development, effective practices, approaches to use, instructional routines, I just want to go back up and show something on the other side of the equation as well. So if you needed to learn more about the development of vocabulary and morphology, you could click right there and learn about how vocab and morphology contribute to reading development, promoting it in the classroom and evidence-based strategies. I did want to quickly go back to um, automatic word recognition. However, Emily talked a lot about orthographic mapping and the significance of the role it plays in um, students being able to read. And on automatic word recognition, that information is linked and fully explained here. And Susan, I'm going to hand it back to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. And we will now move. I'd like to introduce you to the director of the Office of Literacy, Catherine Tarka, who will have some questions for Emily. And um, the slide you can see now is just a sample of um, some of Emily's um, phenomenal work. Thank you, Susan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Tarka. I have just uh, two questions for Emily that arose, um, and I think that's that's probably all we will have time for. Um, we, maybe we can squeeze in a couple others. Um, so Emily, first question for you is, 
Um, as you noted at the beginning of your presentation, um, you're not a trained teacher, you're a reporter, and you've been in many different classrooms uh, all across the United States and talked to many educators. What's one thing that really surprised you in the course of all the research you've done on early reading? Well, I mean, I think the most profound thing is what I said at the beginning, which is that there really is just such a big divide between research and practice. And I, I think the thing that's most shocking is it's not just it's not just the absence of things. It's not just um, what isn't happening, but that there are things that are going on that many teachers are taught and believe will help their kids get, develop good reading skills. But it turns out that they actually go against some of what the evidence has shown. So what's what's really interesting is a lot a lot of a lot of things that um, reading instruction are based on are things that sort of intuitively make sense. But some of the things that sort of intuitively make sense about reading turn out to be not quite true when people have gone in and really studied and been able to finally start to even sort of see what's going on in our brain when we're learning how to read. Um, so I can't express how gigantic the body of research on reading is. I think it's also very important to say that there is a huge body of science of reading and so many questions that really got a lot of researchers really curious back in the 1970s, 80s, like, how does this work? What is reading? How do we learn to do that? What is this all about? This was a really interesting set of like intellectual questions. And a bunch of sciences, scientists decided they could study these things empirically. And they figured out a whole bunch of stuff. And they, they answered a lot of questions. And a lot of basic things about reading and how it works are settled. There's plenty of things that people are still trying to figure out. But a lot of stuff is really settled. There's like a settled body of research that's no longer questioned. I mean, in fact, if someone tried to do a study on some of these things, you wouldn't get the funding for it because be like, that has been settled. We know that. Um, but just because there's a really vast body of research on reading doesn't mean there's as clear a body of evidence about how to teach reading. And that it's a really important thing to acknowledge. It's messier, it's much more complex. Teaching and education are wonderfully complex things, right? And there's no perfect program, there's no perfect procedure, no one's figured out the exact order that you should teach kids phonics, and they, and they never will. It, it will never be perfect like that. But I think what's been most surprising to me is just how teachers just haven't been equipped with knowledge that really could be so useful for them to understand some of the basics of just about how reading skill is, a, is acquired, what kids need, that can then especially help you with the kids who are struggling, right? Because the big takeaway from all this reading research is reading is not something we're born able to do. It, it's not like learning to talk. You surround a kid with uh, oral language and they will learn to talk unless they have a hearing problem or some other cognitive deficit, right? But reading isn't that way. Now it does turn out that some of us need very little instruction a little bit of instruction and we're off. We sort of get the basics of the code and it comes. But some kids need a ton of instruction and most kids need more than what they're getting in school. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see that we have a majority of kids in this country who are not reading very well. Most kids are not reading very well. And that's something that I think we just need to confront. Thank you so much for that. And um, we did have a couple more questions come in. I'm sorry, we won't have time to ask you. I'm just gonna suggest to Susan that you show um, the contact information for, for us at the department. Um, for those of you in attendance today, I know many of you had questions for Emily that we're not gonna get a chance to answer because we're running up at the end of our time. Um, however, we do have an office of literacy at the department staffed with specialists that are more than happy to talk to you about the information that was shared today, talk to you about the Mass Literacy Guide, um, discuss questions and share resources. So um, if you didn't get your question answered today or you'd like to connect with the department more, you can feel free to reach out to the contact info shared there. Thank you, Catherine. And I would I would like to just put, um, say thank you very much to Emily. We so appreciate you spending your time with us today. And we also appreciate all of you who logged on and joined us today. Thank you for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to share